Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to Arc 6, Episode 3 of The Second Stranger. Hi, on Transplaner RPG. If you don't know, we are an odd transgender, Bimpok led, 100% homebrew DD stream set in Andake, an original non colonial anti orientalist world. I am your game master and creative producer, Connie. My pronouns are they, he, and she, and you can find me on the internet at by Connie Chong. That's B Y C O N N I E C H A N G uh, on Twitter, TikTok, Itch, and Ko fi. I'm going to pass along introductions up in over to Quinn. Hi, hello, I'm Quinn. I am a TTRPG designer, sensitivity reader, and actual play performer. You can find me on Twitter at Quintastic underscore, and my pronouns are they and she. And I play Sit Lolly, the grave cleric, who has never done anything wrong in their entire life, who also uses they, she pronouns. And I'm going to pass intros over to Val. Hi, everyone. My name is Valiant Dorian. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a TTRPG performer and streamer. And today I'll be playing Voska, our UNT bard of the College of Spirits, who uses she, they pronouns. And she is, this is her circus, and these are indeed her monkeys. And we're doing our gosh darn best. You can find me at Valiant Dorian or at also Spirit Bear. And I'm passing uh, introductions along over to Max. Hey, y'all. I'm Max. My pronouns are they, them. Uh, Outside of... Here on Transplaner, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, at Starchmonger, uh, and I'll pass it to C. Hey y'all, my name is C, I use they, them pronouns. I am a tabletop performer, a digital artist, and a dramaturg. You can find me making very trans, very gay art on the internet at Pie Sharp Art. I play your misbeloved Oka Unwell Hien, who also uses they, them pronouns, and is officially a bloodbender. Also, Connie has been bullying me in chat since this whole sh uh, shebang started, which is why I have not been able to stop smiling. Uh, other things that make us smile are sponsors. Uh, we are very proud to announce that The Second Stranger is sponsored, as always, by Dimitri Opines and Explain Trade, which is a negotiation skills training consultancy believing in the power of D&D and transplaners potential to grow, tell great stories, and lift up our communities. Explain Trade, if you don't know, trains negotiators for governments, big companies, NGOs, and offers e-learning courses for individuals looking to get a better deal from their boss. So if somebody wants to get one of those so that Connie will stop bullying me in chat, love, would love to see it. Uh, check them out at explaintrade.com, and I will pass things over to Max. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to our very special Patreon Paragons, uh, who are pledged at our highest tier, uh, and those people are Azra, Brooke Wright, Bradley, Charles, Chiacres, Cora Eckert, Hat, Lex Slater, Marvelous, Mitzi, Moonflower T, Purple Mouse, Risa, Rue, Scruffuses, and Targot. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll pass it to Quinn. Hi, hello. Last time on The Second Stranger, Oka, Sitlali, Vasca, and Dewey prepare for their journey to Jukai with Mercy and Dr. Eluso. After a tense morning of sparring, which Sitlali definitely won effortlessly, the team heads to Kinongbo, but that's not where they end up. On the shores of Uma Ori, our heroes discover that a settlement has cropped up around Unmei's temple, and that Lord Henka Oju, the great uniter of Jukai, is here. She has a special guest, the former Queen Moa, who greets Oka... icily. The party learns that Kinongbo is impenetrable and appears to be full of statues, frozen in time. Totally normal thing that happens sometimes, all the time. Oka learns that their half brother, Prince Moa, is stick in the cap stuck in the capital, even worse. Vasca attempts once again to reach Atalanta's soul and is needled by an aggro mercy. Sitlali smooths things over. Mostly. Dewey gets a pep talk from his sword son. Together, the team reaches Kinongbo, and as they enter, they see a sight nobody has seen in over a year. The stars. And that is what happened last time. Use exclamation point recap to reach our full written recap document. And I'm going to toss it to Val to talk about today's title. The titles of our episodes come from marginalized writers of all stripes. Today's title is Adrift Among Stars from the poem Corpse Flower by Vanessa Angelica Villarreal. The full verse reads, A failure fragrant as magic. Ascend the spirit into the design. My particular Chiron, the record that your perfect feet ever grace, this earth. Homing signal adrift among stars, our tender, impossible longing. What have I made of your sacrifice? This bone, it is myself. 
Thank you for that, Val. And now, going into content warnings for this episode and our campaign, they may include fantasy violence, apocalypse, trauma and grief, familial struggles, complex and complicated relationships, flirting and romance, references to sexual entanglements, death of loved ones, memory loss, and disreality. Use exclamation point CW for a full list of these content warnings in chat at any time and exclamation point safety for a full list of our cast's lines and veils. So with that out of the way, let's begin. Dozens, hundreds, thousands of stars spackle the night sky from horizon to horizon. Little luminescent pinpricks of light and fury and hope against a blanket of purple darkness. The milky glow of cosmic dust. The silent roar of divine might. The constellation of Sen, brilliant as a diamond hovering above the spire of the distant pagoda. Oka, Kinongbo is ablaze with life. Lanterns hang from thin wires, glowing red and merry in the winter frost. Flags snap breezily in the wind, and people, dozens, hundreds, thousands of people, spackle the winding path at the bottom of the hill. Food vendors sell yakisoba, takoyaki, yakitori, taiyaki, sweet potato sticks, food of all shapes, stripes, and sizes to satisfy all palates. Dancers flash fans, don masks, twirl, spin, throng. Performers on elevated platforms declaim to enraptured audiences. Music clashes in the air, the sound of taiko drums, bamboo flutes, koto strings being plucked, the smell of frying squid, incense, wine, sugar, uproarious laughter. Color, sound, smell, taste, touch. It's overwhelming. It's Adolin. That's what this is. An Adolin celebration. And the stars are back. Oka, what do you do? Oh, you know, I don't know. Oka stares into the sky. I think that's what they had done. They kind of like f almost fell into Kinongbo through the barrier, and I think they're just completely still in the middle of this throng of activity that was not what we had seen like moments ago when we looked through. And they are just staring up at the sky, at the stars, at the sight that they never thought that they would see again. And I think they're just completely still in the middle of the street staring into the sky. Mm. We pull past your face to back outside, outside of this area, bustling with fur and life and activity and starlight, back beyond the fence where we find Sitlali, Voska, and Dewey. As soon as Oka stepped through that taut, tense, invisibly thrumming barrier in front of you, they'd vanished right into thin air. What do the three of you do? Bosca exhales and turns to, I imagine, Dr. Luso, um, who is probably standing closest to them before this, and she turns to them and says, We can't leave Oka in there. And just marches straight in. Okay. All of you, Dewey and Silali, you see this invisible barrier ripple, like a pebble being dropped into the surface of a pond. <laughs> Uh, as Voska passes through some unseen force and also vanishes. Dewey looks to sit Lolly and is like, Crap. Why did we let them go first? Uh, after Par you? I mean, you are the paragon of Galtanger, right? What does that have to do with... You'll live longer than me, probably? Fine, uh, coward. <laughs> and Sidlali just kind of grabs Mercy's hand and, like, looks at Mercy and is like, You ready? <laughs> I was born ready. I love you. I love you too. Come on, coward. 
Uh, and Mercy steps with you past the barrier, leaving just Dewey and Dr. Luso beyond. Uh, a car do. You can stay out here, just take as long as you need. I'm quite anxious to reunite with Oka and everyone else, of course. Uh, but, you know, if you need to give yourself a pep talk or anything, I'm just going to... I'm just gonna... See you on the other side. And Dr. Aluso also vanishes. Dewey waits for like a couple of seconds. And he like, I think he like tries to calls through the barrier. He's like, Did, are you good? Did you make it okay? Uh, and I think when he gets no response, he closes his eyes and he's like, oh, I hate doing this. And he like closes his eyes and heads, like dives through. I love that. Uh, Dewey, there's just like a uh, lambent shimmer, radiant ripples invisibly cascading across air, and you as well are taken by the stagnation. And we hold for a beat on this darkness before we push through the barrier proper to find all of you standing at the edge of Kinongbo. You've reunited. You are shoulder to shoulder to shoulder right next to each other. And those of you who just entered, holy fuck, the stars are back. It takes you a beat. You have to like blink your eyes just like Oka did because wow, it's like a ju- it's like the difference is literal night and day, right? Because Endake's nighttime used to be a second day. The stars were so numerous and so bright. And it's oh, that like light at first pierces your pupils. And when you blink and adjust and maybe you start, like take a minute to take it all in. You all begin to absorb the sights, sounds, smells, activity of Kinongbo in the throes of Bear's End. That's what this is. That's what it feels like. This is an Adolin celebration. This city upon a hill rises up to meet you. Every tier of the capital bustling with activity all the way up to that pagoda. All of you see an ox cart trundling up the main road, maybe 30 feet down from you. It's massive wheels churning through frozen mud. Uh, It unfortunately hits a hole in the ground filled with water and then splash! A cascade of muddy filth splatters onto the hem of a tiefling woman's beautiful winter coat. And she... uh, gasps in dismay and stalks off. Uh, Around the same time, all of you also see a dancer on a stage wearing a white fox mask doing this intricate, beautiful, graceful dance. You also see a group of teens off to the side kind of snickering amongst each other, and one of them actually like stealthily uncorks a bottle and tosses some sort of oily liquid onto the stage, and the dancer slips, falls, and smacks onto the wood, and the audience starts laughing at this supposedly graceful dancer tripping over their feet. Uh, And all of you also see a fight break out Uh, on the threshold of a large inn, I think on like an upper tier, you can kind of see in the near distance, uh, four party goers are sort of like shoving and pushing and shouting at each other in Jukan, and it's not long, like a few beats pass, and the fight escalates and punches start getting thrown. What did the four of you do? Stare into the sky some more. I think just as like everyone comes out, right? Oka is still just like eyes, I think locked on specifically the constellation of Sen above the pagoda. Until you said that Dewey dives in, Max. Do you think that Dewey dives into Oka's back? Yeah, I think Oka stopped like very close to where the barrier was and he's got his eyes closed still and he runs into their back. Ah! Dewey? And I think oh. Oka then like looks at everyone. Are you all seeing what I'm seeing? She stunned silent, staring into the sky. She's gonna try and summon yeah. Parable. Okay. Uh, you do it. How does it work? It starts off as like she just whistles absentmindedly. This really like a light, almost like a bird tweeting sort of melody and as she does so from her palm the um, rope begins to unfurl around her arm coiling up like a snake and then at the end the blade that she pulls taut against her arm as the rope coils around it and looks down at it that doesn't make any sense the beauty us with her Parables with her, yet stars are still here. 
Does anyone else think that it's a little bit early for an Adolin celebration? It's a touch, yeah. And Sitlali is just staring at the stars and like squeezing Mercy's hand very tightly. Mercy is standing there literally starstruck, right? Her hand kind of limp in yours. And she's just sort of like, like her jaws hanging open, her tusks just sort of like, I think like just glistening under the light. And she's like looking with like her one good eye, like uh, up across the horizon. What the fuck is happening? <gasps> is Kinongbo like, okay, what if, what if this is a safe zone? What if Kinongbo is the only place in Indaki that we have to let people know? And Mercy turns and tries to go out like the same way, uh, but she, what? what What the, what? And you see her like lift a fist and like bang against like solid air. And you sort of feel like that and sense and see like a ripple of like there's an invisible barrier preventing Mercy from leaving. What? Hey, hey, hey! God damn it. Ooh. Lord Oju said nobody was getting out, Mercy. Yeah, I didn't think it was so literal. I feel like an insect trapped under a cup. Bosca mutters under her breath. What else could it possibly mean? What was that? And she's going to step forward and... I'd like to imagine that there are many types of songs that get sung during Adolin. Perhaps one reciting the days of which the celebrations are to be held. And I think Vaska would try to find an open space amongst these courtyards around here and just, with parable, begin swinging it like interpretive dance to create a tune from it and dance and weave as, as, and it creates this beautiful melody of the song, hoping to hear everyone chime in to sing along the different days of Adelon to decipher what's going on right now. Uh, make a performance check for me. Cool. I try to I'm get good. like, all the uh, Jukan folk here to sing along. Yes, and she is dancing. And let's see how the performance check goes. Roll that is flash mob. That is cocked. I'm so sorry. That's <laughs> Roll better. For flash mob. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you say? Uh, so eleven plus uh, fifteen. That is a twenty-six. Twenty-six. Yeah. Your dance goes off beautifully. You're just swinging this thing. I think like the the tip of the arrow dart like glows a little bit. So you create like after images, almost like you're a rave dancer mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, like, right, yeah. like there's after images that glow around you, but it's beautiful. Like you're turning your body in these extremely graceful and I think like attuned ways. And people mm -hmm. even start, start like looking away from performers on the stage to look at you. You know, like you're kind of stealing the show a little bit. Like, and like a little circle of like folks start like thronging around you like, ooh. And when, when the melody that comes out of parable and like your own voice becomes obvious, people start singing along. Um, the days of the week. Uh, Adolin is, of course, an eight-day-long festival ending on Bear. And the eight days of the week are, uh, people start singing, like, Hare to celebrate Sen, the wheel. Swan is for the lovers. Uh, Skad and Nectus. Ox for Galtanger, the sun. Dragon for Mahu, the tempest. Tortoise for the emperor of knowledge, tiger for the chariot of power, raven for the queen, the empress, and bear the last for the only weaver, Nitamusa, of course. Uh, and everyone's sort of like at bear, yay! Like they disperse the song, they start like clapping. This is all in Jukon, by the way. They start like mm -hmm. clapping and like singing and stamping rhythmically along to like a melodic breakdown, a harmonic breakdown, I think, of the song, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And Bear is the day of the week that gets the most love. So you get the sense that this is Bear, which would make it Bear 40 today. Uh, but it was not anywhere near Bear 40 when you entered. It was more like Bear 4 or 5. I think as as everyone is like 
you know, when they do the cheer and there's this kind of like exuberant uh, clapping and cheering, like Vasca kind of like spins the uh, arrow dart up in the air and it twirls back around her arm. And it releases almost like these beautiful icy shards, like crystalline, that just kind of like sparkles in the bright yellow and orange light. And bows. And slowly, just deftly returns back to the party. It is bare 40. Uh, Oka is, uh, maybe during this, has kind of clutched, uh... Is Dr. Elusa's lab coat, like, a safety net for them? Who knows? We won't unpack that. Nobody will be unpacking that. I think they're, like, kind of holding, like, one of the edges of their, like, pockets, right? They're just kind of, like, holding onto it and still kind of staring up at the stars, looking back at Bosco. But they, like, kind of can't take their eyes off the sky. Nobody, stop, stop gay wristing at me. Um, and... Saku, what is happening right now? What does this mean? What does this mean? Where are we? This is either an elaborate illusion, or we're in the future, or we're in the past. Uh, excuse me! And Dr. Luso in Jukan sort of taps someone on the shoulder who's like walking past. Like a person, just like a regular looking grung farmer, I think. Uh, oh, oh, uh, yes, hello. Sorry, I gotta deliver these goods. I mean, Adolin and everything. Uh, uh, yes, just, um, what year is it? Uh, 405 AT? Well, only for the next four hours or so. Thank you. And the grung merchant hops off. And for those of you who don't speak Jukan, Dr. Lusa translates. Um, it's 405 AT, according to them, at least. I'm still not entirely convinced this isn't an elaborate illusion, the likes of the carnival put on by the god shard of Sem. I don't know, that looks... that looks pretty real. And Oka turns to Sitlali. Can you feel the after? Is it here? Let me check. And I think Sitlali kind of closed their eyes and, like, let go of Mercy's hand a bit. And just kind of, like, focus in really closely on the weave. And find, I think, like, a thread of it. And try to follow it. And see how far they can get and see, like, what they can feel if it feels different from, you know, what they just left, if it feels like they remember it. Make an arcana check. The natural 20. So 28. Okay. With a 28 arcana check, you grab onto a thread of the weave and try to follow it. And the thread you grab onto, whoa, it suffuses, it blows up in your mind's eye, it, like in this like lambent, radiant dust, just cosmic, just swirling. It feels strong, powerful. And I think, Sitlali, it had been almost a year, it had been so long since you'd felt the weave like this, since you'd felt the weave whole. And you follow that thread to the boundary of the now, and everyone knows the veils between the now, the after, and the beyond grow thin on Adolin, and because it's Adolin, it feels thin, and you punch through that porous veil to sense the after. I think Sitlali, I think just the sheer force of it, I think they just kind of, like, take a knee with their eyes still closed and like brace themselves with a, themselves with one hand against the ground and just kind of in raven speech to herself go holy shit holy S shit Sitlali, holy are shit. you okay is it out of the fucking see? titties are you okay? again? it's still here this is before the cataclysm what what the the after i can feel it yeah what 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 but that's impossible. That's, that can't be happening. And like Mercy is sort of like, hasn't taken a step away from you, but she's frozen next to you like a statue. Mm -hmm. And like her eyes are just wide in shock. And I think Sitlali turns their head very slowly to look up at Oka. 
And I think Oka was like halfway down trying to grab you. But as you say that, they kind of have like frozen in this halfway down position. And like their eyes, these like double pupils are like sparkling, right? With the like starlight reflected down on them. And like, I think their wings are still out, right? And they just kind of like shift behind them as they look down. And then I think they like almost follow your gaze through their own body and like turn and look back up at the constellation of Sen and the pagoda. Fuck me. Not exactly what I was expecting, but this is, this is, this could be good. Is this good? And I think they actually look at Vasca and Dewey like back and forth. Is this good? I think that depends. Vasca also nods when Silali says that she is unfazed, surprisingly. Stone cold, thinking and focusing with her arm tucked behind her back, supporting her lower back, and holding, um, kind of like, holding Parable's, um, metallic arrowhead in her palm. I think it does depend. I, th- I agree with Solali. Uh, I'm- <clears throat> I'm still not entirely convinced this isn't a grand illusion. Um, should we- should we perhaps ask around? Start to do some probing? Some investigating. On the off chance this isn't a, a whole carnival illusion esque thing, uh, does that mean we only have four hours to stop the cataclysm? Wait, fuck, Dewey's right. You. I don't Mercy. think we should spend it asking around. <laughs> yeah, Mercy. Mercy actually runs up to like some poor merchant, I think, like selling takoyaki, and like goes up and like grabs him. You. What time is it? What. Time is it dear god uh, oh my god i'm so sorry uh, it's 8 30 8 30 wait yeah because that other guy said there were only four hours left uh sorry yeah okay never mind F- forget it uh as she like shoves him back behind behind the cart we have three and a half hours left oka stands still for a hot minute and then i think they take off sprinting as fast as they can toward the pagoda Mm. Uh, how crowded are the streets here? Is it like very hardcore? crowded? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean okay. it's like it's like new it's like Times Square on New Year's Eve, so <laughs> you can sort of like do the math. It's there's everyone in every cubic inch. Okay, I think as you run off, Sitlali still looking at the stars, but like able to catch that in their periphery, just goes, "Wings would probably be faster, don't you think?" I think Oka doesn't even hear that comment. They are like halfway through with like the the sound of the drums and the dancers and the people like yelling and shouting and singing. And they're just like, you could just see their little five foot uh, nine with big old wings out behind them, like pushing through the crowd. Yeah, your wings are like smacking people in the face or like a wing tip like clips someone's like bowl full of like huge pear, like glass pears and you like knock it over and the, the pears go f- scattering everywhere. They like smash against the ground and the person goes, oh, my livelihood. Uh, and you just continue like weaving through the crowd on on eight, this adel and thickened crowd. Uh, what do the rest of you do as Oka starts peeling off? I think Sitlali stands up with like some speed readjust the very intricate robe that they wear that was Leaf's. Um, kind of like fiddle with their cane for a second and then pull themselves up to their entire like five foot two self um, as Oka is like attempting to escape in the background uh, and just kind of look around at everybody um, and say they say okay we don't know what the fuck is happening but that's never stopped us before. I am making some assumptions here, being that I have really only worked with one of you before. But, um, your paragons and your Dr. Eluso and you, you're an Alliance member. Um, you are all remarkable, even if you are a coward, Dewey. Um, that's not what I'm trying. What I'm trying to say is. Stay alert, stay on guard, and 
We'll get to the bottom of this, yeah? And I would like to use my inspiring leader feature to give everybody, except Oka, because Oka already ran away, 20 temporary hit points. Yeah. That speech seems to be laced with magic, I think. And like, Vasca, you and Dewey feel invigorated, right? Like a little bit like of arcane bravery almost, and like determination and focus fills your souls up, right? From Sitlali's words. And Mercy perks up as well. I'm assuming you're also giving Mercy and uh, Dr. Uso 20 hit points. Okay. Mercy huh, lets out a big smile, a big mm -hmm, sounding laugh, claps a, a hand on your shoulder and says, well said as the second of the Hounds of Mercy. Hear that, everyone? Let's crush this. Uh, I think Oka has circled back because they couldn't really get through the throng of people. So like kind of like an anxious dog that runs to the edge of the park, looks at the fence and then comes back and they kind of like don't know what to do with themselves. So I think they come back right then. What are you doing, giving inspiring speeches? Can we get moving, please? Mercy, I told you, your speeches are shit. You really shouldn't do that. What? I'm so sorry. Uh, and Oka I... looks at, like, Dewey and Vasca as they say that. Uh, Vasca, before Oka returns and circles back, gives Solali the slightest of smiles with a breath of warmth in them. And then, Va then Oka arrives, and as soon as Oka says, we should get going. Vasca is already walking away. All right, fine. Let's go. Let's go. And you, you, hey, you, Snady, Snake Lady, stop smiling at my partner like that. Okay, just. <clears throat> All right, let's go. Hounds of Mercy, roll out. Mercy, we're gonna unpack well... that one later. Okay. That's what we we have a mission to focus on. Okay, no, no time to unpack. That's why I said later. Now or later. <clears throat> uh, okay. Sorry for not catching up with you immediately. I'm just busy documenting everything. And you notice that, like, Dr. Lisa has several journals, like, ensconced in blue light that they're scribbling in, you know, like, uh, automatically as they're looking around and follow the group. I think Oka just kind of nods. Like, they should have nodded twice, but they nod, like, six times before they realize their head is still moving and then they stop. Uh, and they just kind of shake their head again uh, to try to clear it. Uh, I can't remember. I was here once when I was like, I don't know, seven? Uh, I don't know the best way forward. You need a path, is what you're saying? And Sitlali smirks a little bit. E what? You... I'm scared of that smile. Deeply. Deeply. But yes, Sitlali, I do. Good. Hold this, and I think they shove their bag of holding into Mercy's arms. And then she like rifles through it and pulls out. Um... Oh no, they would have. I lied. Um, they. Oh wait, the weave is fine. They don't need. They don't need the the Raven Queen feather, do they? Huh? They can just kind of do magic right now, huh? Okay, never mind. None of that happened. No, she does do that. She has this inner monologue that's happening to me right now. Um, <laughs> um, and so Lolly casts Find the Path, uh, which da -da 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 -da, uh, allows you to find the shortest, most direct physical route to a sp specific fixed location that you are familiar with on the same plane of existence. Um, Sitlali assumes, hopefully correctly, that we're trying to get to the big pagoda. Um, so to there, please. You draw on the ambient, thrumming, life-pulsing magic all around you, and you just cast the spell. You don't need that feather. It's just, you just pull on the weave, because the weave is back. It's here. This well that used to be withered is now full again, bursting with magic. So what does it look like as you cast the spell? I think... There is, like, the stumbling of Sitlali being, like, you know, white woman math meme. Um, and then they just kind of put a hand out into the air and draw a very complicated sigil very quickly that, okay, I don't think you've seen them do one quite this intricate before. And it lights up with this, like, shifting pink and purple and blue and even some, like, yellows in there colors like more vibrant than you remember but maybe it was as vibrant before hard to say cataclysm did a lot to everybody um and kind of like turns it almost like a key and just pushes like they're opening a door so sitlali 
you turn the sigil like a key and push, and to no one's eyes but your own, for a split second, grayscale radiates out from you. Every color is washed away except for a path that lights up. Ding, 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 ding. These pink and purple and white and just multicolored lights explode into existence as you see like a shortcut, like deviate off from this main crowded road, like taking back alley paths and like through like thickets and groves all the way up to the top of that uh, of that hill. Okay, I think we got it locked in. Uh, Dr. O, take notes and they just kind of start marching. Uh, yes, of course. Nice spell, by the way. I recognize that sigil. Is it, uh, divining away? Is that what that means? And Dr. Lisa's, like, sort of, like, hustling alongside you. Uh, 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 Oka, are you ready? Oka is, uh, right, I think, on the other side of Sit Lolly, just kind of eyes. I think they kind of keep, uh, almost, like, bumping into things because their eyes keep getting drawn up toward the sky, uh, because that's still a thing. But they are marching along kind of like a very anxious dog. All right, come on, coward. I have a name. And uh, Dewey reluctantly sort of like ducks his head and like falls very closely behind Mercy uh, because that's the only way he's going to get through this crowd. All of you, led by Sit Lolly, who's I think, uh, you know intuitively how to march this path and which choices to make. And I think we find Sitlali immediately like making a hard right, like cutting off from this main road between two platforms of performers, kind of in like a backstage area. And all of you hustle and you see like a bunch of people in the back, like they're carrying buckets of water. They're like changing their costumes, right? They go, hey, you're not supposed to be back here. Hey, wait, you know, like as you're cutting through like an outdoor backstage area, but you're just booking it, booking it. Y'all make it through like the first tier, right? And we like trace your path through like a second tier as well that takes you through a thicket of uh, bamboo forests, I think, by some like very wealthy looking, I think, courtyards and pavilions. This path is cutting through like someone's literal backyard. You know what I mean? Like it takes you like through like a fence that's maybe 15 feet tall at first, like surrounded by fence, like surrounded by bushes and, and trees and whatnot. Uh, and Dr. Luso goes, oh, uh, uh, hold on, I can help with this. Uh, and they make a circle like with their hand and all of you see like a blue light ding, cut open a, like a circle in the wall and they push forward and the uh, light like fills the space in and poof, a hole is created. Uh, that's maybe like a foot thick of just like solid, solid wood and stone. Well, hurry up now. We don't want to get caught. Was that stone shape? Oh, is that what it's called? Uh, I just sort of, I just sort of want things to happen and they occur, usually. Uh, really? Right, re remember when I mentioned that I think schools of magic and different kinds of magic differentiations between wizarding spells and sorcery and I think is mm -hmm. a, rather a, a juvenile way of looking at Thoma technical. A anyway, we, we don't have time. But hurry up. Yeah, we did just like uh, break through someone's private property, so we should get going. I, it'll be fine. It's probably going to be in Rebel in how many hours? Uh, three. Three now. Three. And I think all of you book it through as you like hurdle through this hole, Dr. Luso pauses on the other side and does the exact perfect reverse movement. And we see kind of like almost like a shimmers again, but like coming out backward and you see like the stone reseal itself up, like forming like a perfect like cohesion of, of wall. Stop looking at me weird. I don't know what you want from me. Is it stone shape? Uh, as we book it, you can roll Arcana to see what, what kind of magic that was. With this luck, LMAO. That'll be a 28, please. No! What? Eight. Eight. Eight 20s in a row. Quinn, this buy your nice. lottery ticket now. Quinn, buy it now. Just straight 20s. <laughs> Oh Fuck my, it, I'm, I want to play too. My god. Everyone who wants to roll no, Arcana. I rolled a nine. <laughs> I rolled, I rolled a, a nine. <laughs> I also rolled a nine. Twin. Hey, what are your modifiers though? Haha. -ha. That's plus 12. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bard you're talking to. They've got expertise. <laughs> Me with my 20 intelligence still getting lower than that because I only add a plus 10. 
Dewey, are you rolling too? No, I can't compete with that. <laughs> Dewey. And I don't need to. We're just on the, we're just walking towards it. <laughs> <laughs> Dewey doesn't indulge the magical pissing contest. Okay, so Oka and Vasca, you can sense that whatever magic this is seems to be like very uniquely Dr. O. Like you've noticed that they're able to conjure things with this like kind of blue light and like use kind of some sort of like psionic or telekinetic power to like lift objects and conjure them uh, that you might have noticed while staying at their cottage. Sit Lolly with a natural 20, 28. This is kind of like pure psionic power all the way down. They're just sort of like using their mind to manifest stuff. It doesn't quite cleanly map into what I think you have been taught uh, constitutes sorcery or wizardry or druidic magic or clerical magic or anything like that. If anything with your nat 20, the, the way that they approach magic seems rather um, primal. Like they're just doing it, like without having necessarily put too much like specification into it. Like, it's deeply intuitive to them, even though it comes out in a very intellectual way. But Lolly will remember that. Okay. And now we continue to hurtle along someone's backyard, right? Like, dogs start barking, right? Like, I think you have to go over a koi pond and the fish scatter as you're, like, splashing over the bridge and whatnot, right? And you heard this is, like, the second tier, right? We hurtle up onto the third tier uh, where there's a ton of just, like, shops and whatnot, just, like, everywhere, just, like, darkened shops all closed down because the majority of the Adelian celebrations are taking place on like the lower tiers, while the upper tiers are more residential. And the higher you go, the more noble I think the tiers get and like the thicker the security is. But this is Adolin. Security is a little bit lax on Adolin. So I think you're able to like, we get like a montage of your party like hurtling over low walls, like climbing, like ducking under like branches, like sidling along shadows, like, like cutting through people's ponds and whatnot uh, until we reach maybe like halfway up the hill. Uh, and here, there are uh, a surprising amount of people gathered here. Uh, and you notice it's because halfway up, this is where the wealthy people come to celebrate Adolin. Uh, the low part of the hill is kind of for like the common rabble, right? While the middle part is where all of like the blue-blooded elite and nobility and the clan leaders and lords come and congregate. And I think your party literally crashes a party a little bit because the path that Lolly's taking you is directly through someone's garden party. You know what I mean? And there's like a th like there's another wall with like guards patrolling the perimeter, but the path is cutting like right through that wall. And Sitlali also have gotten on Mercy's shoulders and just be like directing and like yes. pointing. Are you pulling her faster. ponytail as per? Yes. Uh... <laughs> Ow, Sitlali, you don't have to keep doing that. I mean, outside of the bedroom, you know what I mean? You just sort of say left or right. It's just more efficient, babe. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yep, yep, yep. Uh, and Mercy like turns, makes like a sharp left, and uh, there are a ton of guards up ahead. Sit, Lolly. Are, are you sure? Should we maybe come up with a plan before we keep hurtling toward it? Hey, Doctor O, how's your uh, invisibility skills? Can you uh, do a group? Yes, I can. No one resists this. Uh, and Doctor Luso makes like another like I think various like arcane gestures and all of it feel the weave sort of tense around you and a blue light shimmers over your party. And as the light settles down like dust around you, all of you just sort of turn invisible from like the top down, leaving only your footprints behind. Uh, and you start hurtling toward that wall. There's like an open gate where you see like nobles coming in and out, like with their nice winter coats, right? Like on the arms of their partners, tugging their children along, like in and out of this like exclusive garden party. And someone's like checking invitations at the door. You know what I mean? Like outside. And like some sort of magic has been cast and chanted over this space to make it nice and warm instead of like bitterly cold. Like a couple of people are like showing off summer fashions even like, like, you know, off the shoulder robe styles and like classical jukan like traditional wear, you know what I mean? And your party just hurdles right past, I think that main gate invisible, but I need you all to make a group stealth check regardless because you're a large party and the opening is not very big. And I'd be very, very cheeky. Yes. My sweet benevolent DM. Yes. I have the spell silence. Silence typically picks a fixed location, but... I wonder if we could have a sphere surrounded by the party as we hurtle together. I will have you make an arcana check to see if you can sculpt the spell in the way you want it to work. Cool. That is a uh, 23. 
Yeah, but it'll be temporary. I think it will only last okay. for as long as until you get past the gate. Okay, that that works. That helps. <laughs> okay, I mean, so I think in lieu of this stealth check, y'all don't even need it. <laughs> With the silence, you don't need it. Uh, y'all are good. So Voska, describe to me what it looks like as your party passes through the gate. Uh, I think Voska pulls out her flute and plays three notes. And it just exhales almost this translucent bubble around all of us. And there is silence. And if Mercy is saying anything, the sound immediately is snuffed out. If there are any Hey, like, Salali, directions... you should really try doing the, the hair thing you did while, while we're... Go on. And Vo as, as soon as that happens, Vasca tucks the um, flute into a pocket, makes eye contact with Salali, and just gestures with her head and continues moving in the direction she assumes <laughs> the path was leading on ahead. Salali just kind of like gives Vasca a once over and just like nods very approvingly. And there's a very specific look in their eye. Um, I'm gonna see if Mercy catches that look. Are you trying to hide it from her? No, but she is still, you know, my horse. So yeah, I'll have her make a perception check. That's a natural 17. Uh, so... So as Mercy's running, like, silently mouthing words, we see her face sort of, like, her eyes glance up, like, between looking between Sitlali and Voska, Sitlali and Voska, and we see, like, a dark expression fall over her face. Her mouth stops moving, and she's just sort of, like, staring at Voska. Did she stop moving? No, she's continued to run, which is more horrifying. Like, she's, like, booking it, but her, eye, like, her face is, like, still, and she's, like, staring at Voska with, like, wide eye, like, one wide eye. Voska is ignoring it. <laughs> and I think, like that, all of you make it past the gate and into the middle of a bustling noble person's party. There's, like, people, like, with a little, like, meats and, like, drinks, right, and, like, vegetables on platters, like, you know, like, sauntering through the space <laughs> i don't know like it's fancy right we see like nobles under pavilions like uh leaning on cushions talking to each other schmoozing everyone's dressed up to the nines like various bards of like world-class prowess like performing on like elevated decks right and whatnot because this is like a rich person's Adolin party. So it's gonna be like the party of the year in Jukai, you know what I mean? And that's exactly what it feels like. There's like beautiful, like glowing magical illusions just like flying through the air, like a miniature Aurora Borealis, like shimmers over all of your heads. And in it, we see like various illusions of emissaries prancing through like the Borealis. We see like various elementals, right? We see like a Tilian, right? We see like a, 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 a hare with like antlers, right? We see like a fox, right? With like two tails and whatnot, just like prancing through everything. It's beautiful. And as all of you book it, Oka, you see someone in this crowd. Someone who is very familiar indeed. A handsome, red, dragonborn man with short black hair and high, strong, noble features, wearing pristine silk robes. But there are clear signs of mending along the sleeves as though what he's wearing are his last and only good pair of clothes. And he's got these like dour brown eyes listlessly looking around. He's, I think, kneeling at a shogi table, uh, sat across someone that he's playing against. And you recognize him instantly. This is your half-brother, Mo Jing Tian. And on that, we are going to cut to break. Thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Enjoy the fan art reel. Uh, Pichot, Pichot.
Welcome back from break, everybody. Uh, we're back, yay! Uh, Arc 6, episode 3, let's just get right into it. Content warnings for this episode and our campaign in general may include fantasy violence, apocalypse, trauma and grief, familial struggles, complex and complicated relationships, flirting and romance, references to sexual entanglement, death of loved ones, memory loss, and disreality. So use exclamation point CW at any time to get a full list of these content warnings and exclamation point safety for a full list of our cast's lines and veils. So with that out of the way, let's hop right back in. Oka, your eyes, while invisible and silenced, fall upon your half-brother at a nearby shogi table. There's like dozens of bodies milling between the two of you, but it's like time slows down and so you see him. And he's just sort of listlessly there, dourly looking around, right? Like with a uninterested gaze, almost. I think Oka had been running kind of at the front of the group, right? Like kind of right in front of Mercy, so that Mercy, when Mercy turned, Oka could still kind of catch the turn and go in the direction that we were all going. And I think they stopped dead. Uh, and it's like one of those slapstick moments where Mercy bumps into them and then Vasco bumps into Mercy and then Dewey bumps into like, you know, like one of, one of those kind of moments, just, you know, cause we have to, cause it's like that. Cause it's a chase sequence. We have to do that at least once. Um, and Oka stops dead. And they like take one moment where their head is like looking at this person and they just immediately turn, uh, walk right out of Vasco's beautiful bubble of silence. They go right for this table, they arc their fist back and they punch the fuck out of him right in the face. And I think because invisibility only lasts like while you're not attacking someone, as soon as you, they merge into existence right as their fist connects to his face. They shout. Uh, I think as like the punch connects, you fucking asshole! Oka, you ribbon into existence, and from Zing Tin's perspective, it's terrifying what occurs to him. He's a playing shogi, and out of nowhere, the person that exiled his entire family that his mom tried to kill ripples into existence, and like there's like a slow mo as like the fist connects with his face and his cheeks like blah, 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 like ripples and like some spittle flies out and like his eyes go wide and like his head swivels and he I think flies through the air and like skids against the soil and like half lands in a koi pond right like like his top half gets completely drenched Ugh! and before he can even react or do anything Oka what's your armor class <laughs> handsome sixteen. Okay, uh, intercepting you, standing, like immediately getting up and fluttering between you and Jing Tian is the person he was playing shogi against. Uh, a striking falcon-like Arakokura with slate gray feathers on their wings, a tawny yellow-brown throat and barred chest feathers, like a peregrine falcon. Uh, and they're wearing the, this like studded leather armor with a single steel pauldron on one shoulder. Uh, and they have unsheathed like in a single motion, a dagger and has held it up to like the bottom of your chin. And they have almost like a playful smile on their face, but a look in their eyes, they're like, golden striking eyes that kind of is sort of like, don't fuck with me. Uh, but they smile and they say, oh, to whom do I owe the pleasure? In Jukan. Uh, and I think, oh man. Yeah, Oka doesn't speak Jukan at all. Um, yep, we love that for me. Uh, Oka kind of looks down at this person and their eyes flick over to their brother again. Uh, and I think they just kind of like go to move the, like just like, brush the dagger off and brush past this person and they speak to him. I, I think it's you. Uh, they switch to uh, Jingxian. What? <laughs> what is your fucking problem? Ah, so you speak the tongue of the autumn dragon then. And this person switches to perfect two and like steps in front of you as well, like with this like intricate footwork. And as you push the dagger aside, they follow the momentum and they sheath it. And in the same motion, they unsheath a naginata that's strapped to their back, which is like a pole arm with like a curved blade at the top. And they're not brandishing it at you, but they have it just sort of loosely at their at their side, almost as like a warning to you, like don't step any closer to this, to Jingxian. A fellow noble person, I assume. Oh. And their eyes like flick you up and down and up. And you see recognition flash in their eyes. Don't tell me you're the exiled prince. 
Formerly exiled, darling. Do Formerly I know this exiled. person? Formerly exiled. Make me a, uh, make me a history check. 23. You have never met this person before, but as your eyes settle on him, they he pronouns, uh, something about how he looks is beginning to feel familiar because you know now, Mo Jingqian has described this person before. Like after coming back from like various tours, you know, of Endake, like with, you know, as like the firstborn son, right, of the emperor of Long, he would have like schmoozed with like the upper echelons all across Endake. This is one of the upper echelons that he often boasts about knowing. This is Zephyr Yin, son of Lord Hayabusa of the Yin tribe, vassal to Oju. And you would also know with that role that the Yin tribe is one of the four great tribes of Jukai, aside from the uh, Oju tribe, which rules them all. Formerly exiled. I don't believe that's correct. Last I heard, you're still wanted for treason, murder, sacrilege in five of the eight nations. I believe there's a blood debt to be paid in Nepal. Be thankful you are only persona non grata here in Jukai and not wanted for your head. Oh, me and Oka both forgot that, yeah, no, Oka is... Fuck. They look at Prince Moore. What is going on with his face? He ha is scrambling to his feet, turning and running. He is fleeing the scene. No, he absolutely is not. Uh, as Oka uh, uses, I'm going to attempt to use my blood curse of binding. I think just, oh wait, oh shit, hold on. I have a brand new thing. Uh, I have blood bending now. So I think as Principal starts to scramble up, like Oka grabs hold of the blood they share as family members, literally. Uh, they like pull through the weave, fold it, and just like pull their hand into a fist, and uh, he needs to make a constitution saving throw. He gets a four. He does not save uh, as his body stops moving, uh, because I am now able to shape and control the blood within other people. Jesus, did I give you that? Yep. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> I forgot. Level, baby. I forgot. I was like, we're not gonna get a fifteenth level in a minute. We're I'm good. Okay. Uh, the former Prince Moore scrambles to his feet, has like one leg up when he uh, freezes. Right, like his eyes bugging out of his head a little bit. Right, like his like black hair slick with koi pond water, like against his scaled face. And Zephyr, at the sound, sort of quirks their feathered head to the side and turns to look at Mo Jingxian. It appears you have my friend in quite a grip. I'm going to ask you once, politely. Noble to former noble, please release him. Whatever vengeance you seek to carry out against a royal family that has disowned you, please realize that this anger is misplaced. I know what it feels like to be mad at someone, but you don't have to do it. You don't have to hurt this man. Please, he's my friend. And darling, 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 Oka leans forward into him, like like almost like if the uh, like blade gets up, they just like lean right forward into it. You will never understand rage the way that I do. So don't tell me that you know what it feels like to be angry. Tsingtian, would you please tell your friend here that there's been a misunderstanding. Uh, Z Zephyr? Zephyr? Zephyr, this person wants to kill me. Uh, this person wants me dead. They want my head. Please protect me from them. I need to get out of here, please. Understood. And Zephyr turns like their head to look at you, Oka. And at this point, I would like to give everyone else a chance <laughs> to do something and to chime in. All of you have witnessed all of this happening. So Sitlali, Vosk, and Dewey, what have the three of you been doing as this conflict occurs? Vosk will cast. I'm so happy I get to cast a spell. It's been used against me so many times. I would like to cast Wall of Force between 
Oka, and Zephyr. Okay. Uh, the invisibility it, ribbons off of you in a sparkle of, like, I think, blue light as you throw out your hand and cast this spell, because casting a spell dispels yes, your invisibility. invisibility. So what does it look like as a wall of force breaks these two apart? Vasca releases out this wall in between Oka and Zephyr, and it forms up in these icy panels of solid block of ice. And as it forms, it starts off clear, and then it begins to kind of smoke up and turn white, crackling and fractaling with ice. And as it is forming and her visage fully forms down, she says, Oka, remember what we're here for. And I think Oka looks you in the eyes and holds your gaze for the first time, like since we have both returned to the cottage and there is this like striking brilliance of their gaze that like becomes a little, is that grief? Is that an entirely different situation playing over and over again behind their eyes? It might be. Uh, and they take like three steps toward you. I can't leave anyone behind. Not even him. Uh, and they point at uh, Motsin Sing and the blood magic kind of like falls away so that he's no longer like stuck in a statue pose. Yeah. Get up. Get up. Zinxian falls, I think, to his feet and his knees are kind of weak. They like give way a little bit and he stumbles, but he catches himself before falling onto the ground and staggers up to like a, his full height. And like that frantic initial panic, you know, upon seeing you, I think has like, because he's been like trapped in a pose for so long, has seethed and settled down into this kind of almost broken sullenness. Like, this is a man who, whose spirits are, he's already at the bottom, uh, so to speak, uh, emotionally, and I don't think anything you say can beat him even lower uh, than he's already beaten himself. He looks up at you, and you notice now that your faces are so close that there are these kind of dark circles under his eyes. He looks tired. He looks spent. And he looks at you, Oka, and says, <laughs> What are you here to do? Save the day again. I'm here to do what destiny calls me to do. <laughs> and I think for everyone else in the party, like looking at them now, like next to each other, like I think for Sitlali and Mercy, there was like, who is this man? And Vasca as well, who is this man.com? Um, but like once they're standing next to each other, uh, there's a family resemblance, like in the way that their jaw curves in the same way, like the tilt of their nose, there are a lot of things that are different, but like they actually bear a resemblance to each other when they're standing next to each other. And Oka looks down at him. I said, get up. <laughs> if it please you, Prince Hien. And like, like every word dripping with like sarcasm, he like pulls up to his like full height which is aggravatingly similar I think to how tall you are what here to laugh at me here to save me I don't know which would be worse why are you always like this and Oka like turns and starts walking towards Vasca we have 10 minutes and she her eyes dart at the wall I think behind the wall, I mean, how long is this wall again? Refresh my memory. 120 feet. How tall is it? Uh, 10 feet by 10. At this point, guards and other nobility have noticed the wall cutting through the entire party. It's shunted people to either side. We see couples like, oh, like, like trying to get to each other, right? And like guards have like unsheathed, I think their blades, right? Their axes, they're like looking around for like the source of this, like this commotion, this rub rabble. And Zephyr in a silent flap of wings, flaps up onto, like, gracefully lands on top of the wall, 10 feet up, uh, and just sort of calls out to the party, everyone, everyone, there's no who need to worry. This is simply a display from one of our court magicians, a wonderful wall of ice, a uh, little peek into uh, Morozin custom, yes? Enjoy. 
and he seems completely confident and self-possessed and like he's saying this lie like a bald-faced truth and even those of you who know that it's a lie are like yeah uh, wait a minute that's a lie right like he's just sort of like looking at everyone and, like the couples on either side are like huh Aww. And they like start like taking it as like a cute little date idea, like on either side of the wall instead of being distraught. You know, like some scholars look up, hmm, they start like observing the ice, right? And like uh, the guards like sheath their weapons and look at the wall and like nod, kind of impressed at it because they think it's part of the show, right? Like part of the performances. And Zephyr flutters down. And Dewey, what's your what's your uh, passive perception? Thirteen. Flutters down, and because you're invisible, Dewey, I need you to make a strength save. Cool. Somehow I got a 16. Dewey, there's a flutter of wing, and Zephyr unintentionally kind of lands and slams into you. And I think you topple over, because he's like much bigger than you. Even though you're both Eric Kokura, maybe his bones aren't hollow. And I think you stagger a bit and it knocks you out of the invisibility, right? Like light shimmers and like cascades off your body. And tell me what horrendous substance do you fall into? Um, I think there's like a torch. Uh, and part of the ice wall is like close to it, and so it's melted into like some mud, into like a mud puddle. <laughs> and Dewey makes a very sad little like squeaky toy noise as this person lands on him and he goes toppling to the ground into the mud. Oh! Zephyr turns, and right before your feathers fall into the mud and cake your entire body, making you look just absolutely disgusting, a, a wing comes out, and he scoops underneath your body and catches you. Are you okay? Um, uh, Dewey is stunned for a moment and then, like, realizes he's being held up and just, like, very, like, desperately tries to get out of this person's grasp. Oh, yes, of course. My apologies. And Zephyr, like, writes you up and, like, withdraws a wing. Are you in your Paragon garb? Or do you have... Or are your shorts on? Uh, he's wearing many robes, so mm. there's no way to tell if he's wearing shorts underneath. Sure. I love your robes. Thanks. Uh, I don't know where they came from. That's, that's like, a weird way of putting it. Um, I'll just stick with thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, please excuse me for half a second. Tsing Tian! Are you all right? You did say that that person wanted your head mere moments ago. Should I? And you see Zephyr uh, Dewey like reach for the Najanata, like that he's strapped back to his back while he fluttered up. I'd really like to see you try. Dewey, looking up into Zephyr's face because you're so close to him, if you want to, you can roll insight. Sure, I'm the only one who hasn't yet. I rolled an eight. <laughs> You see a little bit of darkness flash across this person's face, just like his brow like knits together for half a second before like that perfect mask. I think of like politeness, friendliness, nobility, like stitches back on onto his expression. <laughs> well, if your cutting words are anything to compare your swordsmanship against, I would say I'd have a worthy opponent to fight. Uh, Zephyr says even, like, maintaining civility, even though you're, like, spitting venom at him. Uh, but Ding Tian raises a hand, right? Like, sort of, like, his hair kind of falling into his eyes. <clears throat> Zephyr, it's fine. But, Sparrow, it's okay. And Zephyr takes that in, that new name, like, cocks his hawk-like head to the side and then nods and, like, lowers his hand from his Najanata. Come on, we have, what, an hour, two, before the cataclysm comes. We need to figure out a way to stop it. Hurry up. You're coming with us now. <laughs> the cataclysm. Right, 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 the cataclysm. All right, fine. Where are you dragging me off to, oh, great prince? Is it Lolly? Let's move. And <laughs> I think just, like... 
nudges um, Mercy playfully, like, in the side with, like, one of uh, her feet and <laughs> yeah. directs. Uh, I think at this voice coming out of... Exactly. At this voice coming out of nowhere, more, like, Jing Xian, like, frowns and, like, cocks his head to the side, genuinely startled at this. Uh, but then, while invisible, Dr. Lusa just goes, well, you know, I just... This feels improper. I... Sorry, everyone. Uh, and all of you feel like uh, the weave shiver down your body as, like, light ripples down and you, all of you are revealed. Sit loudly on top of Mercy. <laughs> Dr. Aluso as well. Uh, and at that, Mo Jingxian lets out a... <laughs> Look at you, bringing your own little party into the stagnation. Yes, because I wouldn't be so foolish as to come by myself. <laughs> foolish. Foolish. What? Should I have dragged my poor sister and younger Sib into this chaos? No, so you should have known what you were and weren't capable of. Oh. So I'm not capable of great deeds and being a hero just because, what, I'm not a paragon? They're not a paragon. Neither is she. And they uh, gesture to Sit Lolly and Mercy in turn. Neither is he. Gesture to Dr. Oluso. <laughs> then you've doomed your friends. I hope you can live with that for the rest of your sullen, miserable life. What are you talking about? Eh, you'll find out soon enough. Where are you taking me? I know better than to resist you, oh great younger sibling. Second born. Oka grits their teeth, doesn't deign that with a response, and turns to Sit Lolly uh, for the way forward. And Sit Lolly simply directs Mercy. Um, <clears throat> Mercy clears her throat as people start looking, because <laughs> the invisibility is gone, like at you on top of her grabbing her ponytail. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along! And she sort of like breathes that out in like a growl and people ooh, like shut her away from her because she's still a very big imposing muscular woman, right? And mm -hmm. she continues cutting through the crowd. Zephyr comes with. Just wordlessly like, he didn't even ask for an invitation. Like he just assumes he's coming. Like he follows your party, I think. This like Falcon like Eric Ogre just walking and he's sticking quite close to Jing Tian and keeping an eye on Oka. And like all of you get the sense that maybe he's like a protective friend or something like that, right? Who like knows his way, you know, like he's... Stop giving me the gay air quotes around friend, all right? That's what, that's what you all <laughs> surmise. Before we go, Voss, how obnoxious are the couples being near my nice wall of force? You see. How much do I want to twist this knife? Okay. Go ahead. Voska. Most couples are being rather gross about it. They're like, oh, like fawning on either side of the wall. But there is one couple, I think, that draws your eye. On one side of this ice wall, you see a like tall, kind of broad, like proud looking woman uh, who's like, like her arms across and she's like tossing her like long, lanky uh, blue hair back over her shoulder. I think she's a tiefling and like laughing right at her partner, her girlfriend on the other side of the wall, who's like kind of svelte, I think, looking like half orc uh and she's like pretending to like pout a little bit <laughs> but like flashing like her girlfriend like you know eyes and a gaze and they both like break and they laugh you know <laughs> and they're like drawing like symbols on the ice next to each other and Voska, something about that feels familiar to you you see i think perhaps a flash of a reflection of yourself and atalanta in them while this conversation is happening and Zintian is being a bit of a little shit. Zephyr is now joining us after turning my magic, my divine magic, into an attraction for couples here. Voska, I think, after like acknowledging that reflection closes her eyes and just takes this huge inhale as all of the cold energy from the wall of force gets sucked into, back into her and it just reduces for the other couples it just goes into like water and splatter of ice but for that one couple 
it recedes slowly. And as soon as she kind of like inhales this cold air, as Zephyr and the prince are walking, exhales and exudes this air, icy air that sends shivers up their spine. And continues moving. Mm. Okay. Sit Lolly. Mercy's path, your path that you're directing her, uh, takes you all through the party. And I think your group begins, continues to hoof it, like past this like garden and the pavilion, like out beyond the boundaries, up toward that pavilion yet again, cutting through, I think, like the star dappled darkness now all around you. Like you're starting to head out of this garden into a residential area with like shutters and like darkened porches. And I think interconnected courtyards teeming with fish, but not a lot of activity as most people are out and about at parties. And as you start to exit this garden area, Oka, are you speaking to Jingtian at all? The little rude snippets, the venomous snippets back and forth, I think have probably continued. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think as you're walking and it becomes quite apparent that you're heading toward, it's like really obvious that you're heading toward the pagoda at the top of the hill. Jingtian just lets out a low. <laughs> oh, you guys are never gonna make it. Never. Never in time. No. Uh-uh. You know, even the fastest way up there is at least, like, what, three hours on foot? <laughs> Good luck trying to get a cart on Adolin. What are you talking about? You're trying to get to the top of the hill, aren't you? Obviously. And I'm just telling you, you're never gonna make it. And I think we like cut away from this conversation to Dewey, where you're hurrying along. I think like Zephyr is kind of like next to you as well, like looking at your party and actually like leans into you, Dewey, as like, I think like thick trees flutter by as you're in a more like heavily groved area of the hill. Uh, I'm sorry, my apologies. How rude of me to not introduce myself. My name is Zephyr. Zephyr Yim. Son of Lord Hayabusa of the Yin tribe, vassal to Oju, and you are? Uh, I'm Dewey. Dewey. Uh, the Paragon of yeah, just just Dewey. Paragon of no, please. I'm enraptured. Finish that thought. Uh, Galtanger, but just Dewey is fine. Paragon of Galtanger. <laughs> what you mean, I've like? Said too much. Karvach Turai? Uh, kind of, yeah. Do Do you perhaps mean that you are a worshiper, an ardent supporter, and follower of Galtanger's ideals? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I um, well, I what? No, you know, like Parag. Uh, do you know of Paragons? Certainly. Ever since I was a young child, my parents have lavished me with tales of the heroic paragons of the past, the gambit of queens, the great rebuilding. My favorite, personally, was always Shu Hai Miao, as a Jukan, of right. course. Yes, yeah, so Dewey's realizing now he said too much. Uh, it's like, uh... Oh, are you perhaps a stage actor? I know we're putting on a production of the Paragon War sometime, well, should be coming up soon. Yes. Uh, are you Sorry, the... I was just so in character. No, uh... no, of course, certainly, certainly, wow. Well, I am, I am such a fan of actors. You know, as uh, a Jukan myself, I know the value of masks. The masks we wear, the masks we don't, the true faces we craft and keep hidden. And I think what you bring to the world, your art is so valuable, Dewey. Thanks. Um, I'll... Oh, uh, as Karvach, uh, are you the, the front part or the the horse, the horse part? Oh, I, I usually get stuck with the horse part, you know, uh, the, usually the, really? the shorter you are, the easier it is. That does you know make sense. Is. Like lion dancers in too long, so I've heard. Yes. <sighs> That's a shame, though. Sorry? <laughs> I mean, you have such a beautiful face. Dewey freezes at that. <laughs> Doesn't know how to respond. 
I think I'm like Dewey being flustered, like, what? Uh, Dewey, you hear Dusty's voice in your head go, um, Dad, I'm gonna like close the metaphorical door right now and give me some privacy. Oh my god, oh my god, this is so. <laughs> we, we cut away, we cut away from Dewey uh, and go over to. I wanna see what's going on with Silali as we're making our, our way up the hill. Um, I think Silali is pretty single mindedly focused on the path TM. Um, is Dr. Aluso nearish enough yeah, totally. to like, Everyone's have a conversation like, with? Yeah, you're like a hiking party, right? You're all sort of just okay. around. I think as they're going, um, I think Sitla I think they've gotten to a point where like Mercy doesn't need as much direction because it's kind of a straight it's like a straighter line from here. So Sitlali kind of glances over at Dr. O, glances and sees that Oka is occupied, and the mentally goes, Well, there's probably not a better time to do this, and then just kind of like leans down and is like, Hey Dr. O. Uh yes. And they've been like scribing in like four different journals this entire time, floating around them, almost like in a halo. Remember um, what we talked about uh, back in Dabathati, uh, Dabathati rather, uh, about uh, the whole um, the after and um, if we need all of the paragons, like all of them, all oh, of them. Oh, yes, 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 I do, I do. Why do you bring this up, Sitlali? Because we have the after right now. I, if this is the real after, which I'm not entirely convinced it is, still 99% sure this is all an elaborate illusion. I can assure you it's not. I've well, never felt it that clearly. They clap the journal that they're holding in their hand, like shut, and they look up at you with very serious, I think, blue eyes. Then you should give it a try. Uh, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt, love, but... There's like 15 minutes left until midnight, and we're still a while off. Shit. Um, I'm sorry, did you just say 15 minutes? Yeah. Mercy has the loudest voice of anyone in the world. Yeah, 15 <laughs> minutes. I mean, we wasted like half an hour just like walking around at the bottom. We wasted another half hour like just talking to each other and then the whole garden thing. Yeah, there's like 15, well, 13 minutes actually, because I'm explaining the fact that there was 15 minutes, and I'll oh, shut up now. How calm is the prince right now? Xingxian is remarkably calm. He's sort of, like, walking along, just, like, looking. He does not seem upset. Like, all, what, your frantic energy just seems to slide right off of him. Right? He's actually, I think he's got like a, a fish skewer out and he's just sort of like ambiently eating it and just like, like spitting the bones onto the ground and just walking. Prince Mo. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I know you. You're a paragon too, aren't you? Paragon of Nitbuza. Do so you know who I am? Of course. Vaska. I know all about you. Not much to do when you're exiled on the road except learn. Learn rumors. Learn gossip. So you know me and all of the truths of outside here. And you have been here this whole time. What happens when the cataclysm hits? <laughs> you seem rather calm. Uh, you'll find out soon enough. Don't you already know, though, Paragon of Nibuza? And Zingtian spits out the last um, spine of the fish and leans in really close to you, Vaska. And his, like, lackadaisical, like, deeply uncaring and beaten down face lights up for half a second with gleeful misery. The world ends. Vaska is steel. Vaska is ice. Vaska is unmoved as she leans closer to the prince. I understand loss, pain, and bitterness. We shall speak more, I'm certain, due to your comfort and my faith. And as she says these words, the ice and wind just blows from her and looks to the rest of the party. Okay, I think... I think we will 
see everything. And based off Prince Small's reactions, I do not think we have too much to fear. Do we? <laughs> what? What do you mean? The prince is calm. Almost like he knows what happens. We have 15 minutes of the cataclysm, yet no fear, no doubt flashes before his eyes. He knows who we are, which means he was outside, which mean, and he does not seem to have the air of no recognition like Lord Zephyr here. What does that tell us? That he knows what happens. Zephyr chimes in. Because are you like trying to disguise this from Zephyr when you speak? No. No. I'm... My apologies. I couldn't help but overhear... Cataclysm? It's the name of the show we're putting on. I thought it was the Paragon War. Alternate title. Oh. Keep going, Roscoe. What could this all possibly mean other than the prince has experienced this before? That is a mighty large leap to make, Paragon of Nipusa. And Prince Mo Jingtian, the former prince, flicks the empty stick uh, off into the bushes, where it just sort of lands ambiently amongst the winter leaves. And Mercy cuts in. Uh, guys, we're wasting time. We have three minutes left. Can anyone teleport? Can we plane shift or something up there? Too far. Isn't it, Prince Maw? Sure is. Now you are a smart one. Doesn't the looming vanishing scare you? Even just a little? What? Oka. Aren't you gonna try to stop it? I mean, you're a hero after all, right? Why stop now? And you, Dingtian gestures at Sitlali, and you, Mercy, and Dr. Luso. Three of you aren't anything special, you're just like me. We're not paragons. We're fucked if the cataclysm comes. Know what I mean? Come on, put some hustle in that step. And with your continuous boasts and attempts, to writhe your little claws underneath our skins, I am more and more convinced. I'm a storyteller. I know how stories are weaved. And I know another attempt at the story right in front of me. 30 seconds, everyone. 30 se <sighs> Fuck this. Sit stay close. What do you mean, stay close? We gotta get up there. I don't know how, but... For the record, I can plane shift if we would like that option. Uh, uh, Oka, I think, grabs Vasca by the front. <laughs> there are a lot of stories. The ones with me in them usually end up as tragedies. You better be fucking right about this. I think, I think Sitlali drops as fast as they can from Mercy's shoulder. I think they've, like, practiced that move uh, the more that they've, like, been together. And, like draws this really ornate sigil and just yeah so just everyone grab hands um like right now and then just slams it <laughs> i'd like to think that when we are slamming it like oka is still like grabbing onto Vasca, and we just yeah that's share. how that connection happens yeah we just share as she just looks at you meeting your gaze fully and i think there's a shred of that's fair the only person that doesn't join hands is Xing Tian. He actually, like, steps back and, like, raises his hands up and, like, walks away from the circle as the magic begins to build. Even Zephyr is, like, holding on to Dewey. I think, like, with one wing. The other wing has, like, is, like, touching Mercy's bicep and she's just going, watch it, bird, bird guy. Uh, but, like, he's, like, touching her. Um, and Xing Tian just sort of says, hands up. <laughs> See you guys on the other side. And that's the last thing any of you hear uh, before the weave tenses around all of you and your molecules, Sitlali, the spell goes off without a hitch. Uh, your molecules discorporate uh, and turn into this ambient cosmic dust that swirls around you and colors sort of turn into these long pillars and stripes around you as you sort of warp and your feet land, I think on solid ground to the top of the hill. 
you are at the base of the pagoda. There's still a couple dozen feet uh, before you reach like the front steps of it. Cause I don't think you've been there before Sitlali. So you're off by like a couple dozen feet, I think. Um, and you see like the massive constellation of Sen just huge, like winking in the sky above you, like laced through with these like black and purple and gold and green plumes of dust just in the atmosphere. And you can sort of see what it looks like in its full glory, almost like a wheel within a wheel or a fox chasing a rabbit or a rabbit chasing a fox. It's everything and nothing and all possibilities and only one possibility at once. It's set, circular, infinite, divine and radiant and all of you feel magic, massive, intense, powerful, beautiful magic radiating outward from the pagoda. There is something massive within its 80 story, I think, height, right? Just like above, punching like a black spire up toward the sky. And Mercy says, okay, I think we made it in time. Fuck. As one by one, the stars go out in systematic lines from north to south, almost like someone fading the dimmers on a universal slider. One row, then another, then another, then another, faster and faster and faster, the light just being sucked out of the atmosphere. And Zephyr is going, what, what, what's happening? What, no. No, like the full panic of someone who's never witnessed the cataclysm before, but all of you, a familiar dread settles over you. And since this is your second time witnessing the cataclysm, what do you do now that's different now that you know what's coming? All right, I'll bite. Uh, I think Dewey is going to look around the first time this happened there was an earthquake of sorts and there was like rubble falling on him so this time he's gonna look around make sure there's nothing in the immediate area that would like fall on him uh but otherwise he's going to sit down on the grass outside of this pagoda and sort of like lean back on his hands and watch the sky because the first time around he didn't see what happened uh and number there are two possibilities two outcomes to this Number one, the cataclysm happens again and everyone dies and that's it. Uh, and number two, in the case that doesn't happen, he wants to gather information. Because he doesn't know what happened during the cataclysm. Because they were underground. Uh, so he's just going to watch the sky and take in as much as possible. Dewey, as the stars begin to wink out systematically, you calmly sit. Right, You splay your feathers out behind you and look up and observe. Uh, and I think you hear Zephyr's voice, try like a controlled kind of calm at first, being like, what's happening? This, what is this? What, Ding Tin, wait, he's not here. Uh, Dewey, Dewey. As like a darkness begins to fall and this new friend, colleague, person that you met on New Year's Eve, who seems weirdly attached to you now, uh, is calling for you in the darkness. Dewey looks over uh, just for a a split second he doesn't want to take his eyes off the sky uh but he looks at this like panicked face of someone who's never done this before and he just does sort of like a a sort of like pat pat on the ground next to him on the grass um and goes back to watching intently i will roll to see if he notices that not this time, Dewey, he doesn't. Uh, he is too panicked. He's looking up uh, at the sky, like taking a few steps back, like down this hill, like what? what's happening? I, my parents, my parents. Uh, and he's like turning and you feel like a flutter of feathers as he just, he's like booking it out of there as sure enough, the ground starts to shake. But before we get a little too ahead of ourselves here, Dewey, make a perception check. 23 total. 23. You gaze up at the darkening sky and you notice, mm, I think several things stand out to you. One is that when it vanishes, it's like not exactly systematic as in like those stars are just like turned off, but it's almost like a, f like a hand covering a lamp. Like there's like a fading edge that comes in, right? Like an edge of it just sort of like 
almost like uh, curtains going down, right? Like over the sky. It's just like a line just across the entire sky fading downward, right? It's systematic. It's not just like random patches of darkness here or there. It's almost feels intentional. With a 23, I'll let you ask a follow-up question and I'll have to answer honestly. Also, you can feel the weave beginning to tense and snap around you. And like a horrible sound is beginning to ring out, right? Like metal screeching against metal, originating from nowhere and everywhere at once. Uh, for someone like Dewey, who doesn't have, you know, such a close relationship with Galtanger, uh, the god shard that he's just acquired recently, uh, what does it feel like to have that severed? So this entire time, Galtanger has still been inside you. The god shard is still within your soul. When the cataclysm happens again, I think you feel Galt because you're you are specifically trying to attune to how Galtanger's doing inside you. You can feel her bubble up in flaming hot fury and terror and a desire to just explode out of you and 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 stop this from happening, but she's not mm, she's not strong enough to do that yet, even with you. Dewey. And I think, like, you can feel it almost like a, a, a captured fireball fizzling against, like, the confines of your soul as she's reliving this, too. She's reliving this as well. And I think you hear her voice for a split second, like, surface up into your mind when usually you'd have to be near a holy site, right, to be able to hear her or commune with her or dreaming. But here it just comes up and you hear her go, Cardu, my Paragon, no, no, not again, not again, the pain, the pain, no, as she's just like raging against you, not wanting to experience this suffering of being split apart yet again, because that's what the cataclysm is for her, being severed from a greater part of herself that resides in the beyond. That's what you get, Dewey. Uh, we're gonna bounce over to... Vasca. I believe the last time Vasca witnessed the Cataclysm, she was on the shores of the bar, barring with Atalanta and her trident. Flute in hand as she weaved and bobbed away from each strike just using her flute as her shield, meeting her every blow. But then the stars began to fall. Everything began to sway. The waves began to move erratically. Sand in their eyes. And all she remembered is Atalanta's protective frame immediately pulling her close. While interlocked with her flute pulling her close and shielding her from everything. And as Vasca now presently is witnessing all of this, seeing Zephyr flee to be with his loved ones, seeing Dewey relax, seeing the panic across everybody, a single tear falls from her blue eye. Cold and frozen, wit actually witnessing this without the protection of Atalanta. And she unfurls parable and will cast wall of force again as a dome protecting the entire party. And as she does so, parable plays a song similar to the songs of inquiry that she has played on her zither to call for Atalanta as she is channeling the sea of reminder of Atalanta swinging at parable and just willing that same feeling of warmth and protection for her friends because even though she knows that there's more to this she needs to protect them just like she would 
A dome of force springs up, invisible and indestructible around your party, covering all of you. Just in time, as the ground begins to tremble and shake violently, violently, but it's kind of like muted from like within your safe bubble. And all of you see like this like massive black pillar that is the pagoda, I think, crumble, right? It begins to actually crack and there's a massive groaning, shattering noise as it falls. And I think it breaks over the dome, just bam, an avalanche of rock and mortar and tile and glass wood just cracks and breaks all over the dome, right? As you cast this protective bubble and this spell. And as the pagoda continues raining down, like furiously around you, pinging off of this force field. And Vasca, as you pull out Parable and swing it, right? Trying to invoke Atalanta's soul, presence, something. Are you specifically reaching into the after? I'm going to say no. I think Vasca is reaching to Atalanta's soul. See. Period. Like that. Right? Like, no period. matter, just period, just okay. Her energy. Make an arcana check. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, that is a 27. 15 plus 12. What the fuck? Okay. 27. Swinging parable. I think you see these, like, beautiful radiant lines get carved into the darkness around you leaving these like after effects right lighting up the darkness and like these erratic bursts all around you within the dome and a vision flashes across your face Atalanta's face and suddenly you're no longer in this dome you're on the beach and you can hear the crashing of waves around you, the smell of salt in your nostrils. You feel Atalanta's strong arms around your body as you look up at her and the cataclysm is happening. And her like long, like tiefling horns curled up, her hair all around her, gills flaring. Uh, she's looking down at you. Vasca. hey, it's gonna be okay, all right? Just look at me, just look at me. Are you here? Of course I'm here. She's speechless. She just grabs onto her and just stares at her and just goes, You're in danger. Careful! And Atalanta actually, like, pushes both of you and tumbles out of the way as I think a pillar of fire erupts from the surf and spits out like a massive glob of, like, magma onto the sand that crystallizes immediately into black gas and steam, right, from where it hits. And she, like, just in time, because you're stunned, like, pulls both of you into like a commando roll, like across the sand, like both of you like skid a little bit into the surf. And you can hear the screaming of other people on Bacchanalia Beach as like shit starts to go down. And the last of the starlight begins to wink out. She's on top of you, covering you, like holding you, protecting you. Hey, Vasca, it's gonna be okay, all right? It's gonna be okay. I love you. I love you. You are pulled out of that, back into your body at the pagoda. And we are going to cut over to sit Lolly as this shit's happening. I think as they watch the stars go out again and they feel the ground shake again, unbidden, unwanted, unwelcome, the thought comes to them. Lonely. And you hear a voice, sit Lolly. A familiar voice you haven't heard for months, but as soon as you hear it, it's like it never left you. Mm -mm. Not at all. The darkness, perhaps. This horrible sensation, I think, fills you. The terrible thought, the darkness, perhaps, never left you. And you hear... Sit. No, no, not again, not this, not again, not this. No, 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 absolutely not. No, 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 no,
don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. And they are yelling this out loud. And like, I think, yep, Mercy is on you. She's holding you. She's saying, Sit Lolly, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, you're okay. You're okay. But Lonely's voice is so loud in your head, Sit Lolly. It's drowning everything out, even Mercy, who's frantically holding you, trying to calm you. I think Sit Lolly might do something a little feral. Sitlali gathers the cloak around themselves for comfort and says, Raven Queen, guide me, and disappears. You wrap your cloak around your body. You're not taking mercy with you, are you? I don't know if you can. I can't. I can't, yeah, I can't take okay. anybody with me when I do this. And just try to, like, <laughs> their voice is so loud in your head. You say, Raven Queen, guide me, and you vanish. Where do you go? The ethereal plane. Ethereal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the ethereal plane looks pretty much exactly like the now, but just like everything's kind of ghostly, right? And I think in Andake, you can sort of, it's like you're a ghost. You're like in the ghost plane. You can see people around you, but they can't see you. And it's more than being mm -hmm. invisible. Like if they put their hand where you were, they can't touch you, right? But like you'll see their hand tr passing through you, right? Everything looks kind of misty and ghostly, right? And poof, you snap into the ethereal plane. And the voice follows you. Sit, Lalik. What is this? I don't need you! Yes, you do. And sit, Lolly, in the ethereal plane, make me a perception check. Yeah. 29, because I got a 19. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. <laughs> she, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 19. <laughs> wow, okay. it's really like your crit failed there, Quinn. My god, I'm disappointed. The ethereal plane is the spitting image of the now. The same thing is happening here. The cataclysm is still occurring. Like, you just can't get necessarily hurt by anything in it. But you do see something very disturbing indeed. The mist, the white mist, is turning black. Little by little, slowly but surely, this mist, which used to be like necrotic energy, native to Andake, right? Native to the after that bleeds, that's bleeding into the now, the ethereal plane, sort of like the, the veil. It is the veil between the now and the after. If you cross the uh, border ethereal, you'll get into the after. This white mist is turning empty oblivion laced darkness is seeping into this veil corrupting it turning it negative and i think that's what you do different silali as lonely's voice continues to rage and rage inside your head sit lolly quick you want your magic don't you let me in. And we cut to Oka. Oka stares at the sky. And then they can't. They can't. They can't watch the stars go out again. They can't. And I think they kind of reach out, still looking up and they take Dr. Luso's hand and then they pivot to face them. And they refuse to look back up at the stars because they can't, they can't watch the stars go out again. So they'll watch Dr. Luso. They'll watch their face the whole time and let everything else fall away. Can I roll insight? Yeah, yeah, you can. Also, all of you gain inspiration, you unhinged homosexuals. What'd you get? True Oka fashion. I rolled a natural one. I think what a nat one means 
is you see something in Dr. Luso's eyes that you don't want to see. Uh, and as you peer, like, they were looking up, but they notice, they feel you looking at them, and they're like blue eyes, like wide with like shock and some fear, anxiety for sure, right? Flick down and lock onto yours. Okay. Okay. I. I. I don't. I don't remember this. I don't know where I was the night of the cataclysm. What? This is new. I thought you were at your cottage. No. No, this is. This is new to me. And as they look into your eyes, you see something flicker in the depths of their gaze. Just real fast. Something. Something you've never seen before. Uh, and I think with your Nat 1, you can't, you can't catch any specifics. But there's something flickery, I think, within the depths of their, of their gaze. And because, because of your Nat 1 insight check, I want to ask you, what about that scares you? Kitsagatin is Oka's hope for the world. Is their guiding star. If he's lost, so are they. And that terrifies them. The two of you gaze into each other's eyes. Dr. Luso searching your own. And I think with your Nat 1, they see the terror on your face. And something in their expression falls a little bit as they like see fear instead of like comfort or support, I think, on your face. Okay. Please. I. And all of you see an ox cart trundling up the main road, its massive wheels churning through frozen mud. It hits a hole in the ground filled with water and splash! A cascade of muddy filth splatters onto the hem of a tiefling woman's beautiful winter coat. She ha, gasps in dismay and stalks off. And then you see a dancer on another area of the bottom of the hill, uh, on a stage wearing a white fox mask, doing an intricate, graceful dance. You also see a group of teens off to the side, snickering. One of them uncorks the bottle, throws some oily liquid onto the wood, and the dancer slips, falls, smacks onto the stage, and the audience starts laughing at them. And you also see a little ways up the main path here on Adolin, uh... A fight break out on the threshold of an inn for partygoers shoving and pushing and shouting at each other in Jukan. And it's not long before the fight escalates and punches start getting thrown. And the six of you stand at the threshold of Kinongbo. The night sky luminescent with stars glittering down upon all of you. Okay, what's your armor class? I beg your fucking pardon. This is the second time I've told you this episode. Sixteen. I think as I think as the six of you stand there, like what? Huh? Oka. Your solar plexus crumples in on yourself, and you are flung out of the line of your party, like. Like something hits you really, really, really hard and really fast. And oh, it hurts. Oh, you feel parts of your ribs crack and ooh, you fly through the air. And I think you crash into a food stall uh, with some poor guy, I think, selling takoyaki. And he just goes, ah, damn it. Uh, and I think like the wood just splinters all around you and like hot squid starts like falling all over your body. Right. As you take 16 points of bludgeoning damage and nine points of necrotic damage uh, as whatever like pulse that hit the center of your body I think is sending like black veins ugh, like shooting up your skin a little bit before they pulse once like throbbing like, like it hurts and then like settles down and all of you see on the other side of this main stall like stepping out onto the street a person who is maybe five foot uh, okay how tall are you? five foot nine five foot ten 
and they have like this pale skin that's almost kind of translucent, the skin of a changeling. Uh, and this kind of like white hair tied up into like a tall ponytail sweeping down their robes that none of you have ever quite seen the make of before. They're quite odd robes, almost like they're not they're not a make that any of you recognize, but they are quite beautiful. They're like a kind of like a dark green etched through with gold and silver. Uh, and they have a sash around their waist and their hand is currently outstretched. And I think it's crackling with like this kind of dark energy that they lower kind of like disdainfully. And their entire face is spackled through, I think with these stripes that seem to not be tattoos, just like part of their skin, almost like a tiger stripes that go all the way up their throat, all the way up to their face. And one of their eyes is a swirling miasma of differently shifting colors, just one after the other, right? All different kinds of colors. Sometimes when they blink, it turns into that of like a lizard's eye. When they blink, it's like bright gold and it swirls, etc. It's just constantly changing. And the other eye is dark blue all the way through, scleras and all with double pupils. And Shuhai Miao steps forward onto the street after like lowering their arm and they spit at Oka and they say, don't get in the fucking way again. You understand? And their eyes sweep over the rest of your party, like kind of like, disdainfully, they linger on Voska and Dewey for two seconds, they're like head quirks, and then they stop on Dr. Eluso, who's still, like, shell-shocked from, like, what had happened between them and Oka in, in the dome. <sighs> Dr. Eluso looks up at Shu Hai Miao. Shu Hai Miao cocks their head to the side, and genuine surprise, like shock, and then softness settles over their face. <gasps> Sagu? And they step forward and they kiss Dr. Eluso. And we're gonna end the session there. Uh, hi everyone, that was session two of our Jukai party, uh, Arc 6 episode three. Uh, I've been your GM and creative producer, Connie. My pronouns are they, he, and she. You can find me all over the internet at by Connie Chong. That's B Y C O N N I E C H A N G, TikTok, Ko Fi, <laughs> Twitter, itch. I'm gonna pass along introductions over to Quinn. Hey, hello, I'm Quinn. Um, I'm, I'm a TTRPG designer, a sensitivity reader, and an actual play performer. You can find me on Twitter at Quintastic underscore. Um, what? I don't need to pass it to, uh, to, 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 to Val. I am once again burdened with knowledge. Hi everyone, my name is Valiant Dorian. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a TTRPG um, performer and Twitch Friday streamer, and today I had the pleasure of playing Vasca, your College of Spirits bard who loves Wall of Force, apparently, who is a she, they pronouns. You can find me at Valiant Dorian or at Otso Spirit Bear. Good luck on that treasure hunt, because it's the same one that Connie's putting us on right now, and I'm gonna pass this over to Matt. Hi, I'm Max. My pronouns are they, them. I am a broken man. Uh, I also play Dewey Quirk, uh, the ass of a centaur. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, <laughs> at Starstronger, and I'll pass it to Paragon of the Hour. Uh, see. Apparently not, though. Not even the only Paragon of Sen in this fucking time loop. Hi. Hi, my name is C. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a tabletop performer, digital artist, dramaturg. Yeah, for this whole thing. Um, You can find me making very trans, very gay art on the internet at Pie Sharp Art. I played, I played Oka Hien. He uses they, them pronouns. I don't even have a funny quip for you. I, too, a broken man. You've done it, Connie. I hate to admit it. You've broken me. My voice is hoarse from screaming. That's it. That's all I got.
Uh, hope you all enjoyed that. We're going to unpack that in two weeks. So stay tuned. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to raid someone awesome, no doubt. So use the raid message in chat. Let them know Transplaner sent you. Toss them a follow if you like their stuff. Even if you can't stick around, say Transplaner sent you and rep the brand in chat. We love you so much. Tune in next week for the Moreau's Party's next session. Oh, oh what's going to happen? Oh, daddy issues, am I right? Have we gotten there yet? Maybe I'm going to say it anyway, because daddy issues all about. Um... We love you all so much. Tune in Saturdays at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, right here on Twitch at Transplanar RPG. Shpisho! Bijo!